Hello, everyone. I'm Patricia Kaufman, the co-founder and communications director of the CLL Society, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled The Future of CAR-T Therapy. Can CAR-T cure CLL? Before we pass the microphone to our moderator, Dr. Brian Kaufman, and today's featured presenter, Dr. Joe Frietta, who brings us his beautiful slide set, the authority of his long research and clinical experience, and his unbounded enthusiasm for moving CAR-T science forward, we'd like to thank Adaptive Biotechnologies, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, and Novartis for making this webinar possible through their grant support. At this time, I would like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Brian Kaufman, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of the CLL Society. Thank you, Patty, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, this is going to be a very special hour, and we're reserving a lot of time at the end to answer your questions. So please remember to type those in as we go through, and we'll answer them all towards the end. Um, we're very happy to be able to introduce Dr. Joe Freyetta, who's an assistant professor of microbiology at the Perlman School of Medicine in Philadelphia. And um, as many of you recall, UPenn has a very long uh, and a proud history of uh, working with CAR-T uh, and has, as Joe will point out, uh, two of their first three patients are alive and well and CLL free more than 10 years out. Dr. Frieda has developed many novel approaches for the treatment of cancer through genetic modification of the T cells. And he's going to explain how he does that and what's going on there. That's contributed to the initiation of multiple clinical trials and to the FDA approval of the first CAR T uh, cell therapy in 2015. Uh, uh, Joe assumed the directorship of the research lab in the first of its kind Center for Advanced Cellular Therapies where his group led initiations to use CAR-T infusion products for key biomarkers, mechanisms of potency, with the objective of predicting clinical responses to ad uh, adoptive uh, cell therapies. So we can tell who's it gonna work for, who it isn't gonna work for, and what changes we might be able to make. He now directs the Tumor Immunotherapy Laboratory as a faculty member in the same center. Um, uh, thank you, Joe, for joining us today. We have a couple poll questions here. I'm confident in my understanding of how CAR-T therapy works, and they go from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And just take a second for that. And here's one that I bet there's not a lot of yeses to, but it'd be interesting to know. I have had CAR-T therapy. We will not be asking that question again at the end, because we don't think anybody will have it over the next 45 minutes or so. And very interesting. So only 4% uh, uh, strongly agree that they understand, and but a significant number feel that they do understand a little bit, and more than half don't understand at all. And we do have uh, uh, five people who've had CAR-T therapy in the group, and if you include me, that's six. So um, there is a little bit of uh, preaching to the choir here, uh, but mostly these are newbies. Uh, I'm going to, again, thank Dr. Frieda uh, for being here, and I'm going to hand it over to you now, Joe. Thanks so much, Patty and Brian, for that wonderful introduction, and, and thank you all very much for joining us today. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Um, so after we re-poll the audience, let's see how I do uh, at the end. Um, so I want to talk to you today about what is arguably the epitome of personalized medicine for CLL, and that's, of course, CAR T-cell therapy. Um, and my goals during our time together are to sort of give you an overview of, of how the immune system fights cancer at a basic level, how, of course, we can enhance it, um, you know, that immune system with CARs, and also what happens during this treatment. I sort of want to take you through each phase of the CAR T cell therapy process. And then in addition, I, I wanted to take some time to talk about the responses that, that we've seen so far. And Brian has already um, alluded to two uh, remarkable responses, but there are many more to talk about. Some of the side effects, of course, of treatment, and then ongoing research that's being done at uh, the University of Pennsylvania and many other cancer centers um, to improve CAR T-cell therapy for, for CLL and also other um, tumors as well. So let's see here. 
So in the way of introduction to cancer, we're faced with two major problems. Unlike an infection that's caused by an external agent invading our bodies, cancer really arises from within. It's, it's, it's one of nature's cruelest tricks. So in simplest terms, a cancerous cell is, is a corrupted healthy cell with the ability to, to divide endlessly, to undergo countless cell divisions. And what results is an abnormal growth of tissue, and this is the tumor, whether it's in the blood or in an organ. And perhaps the greatest challenge that we face in, in treating cancer is that a cancerous cell is nearly indistinguishable from its healthy counterpart. And this is really the reason why conventional treatments such as chemotherapy and maybe radiotherapy for some cancers, although in, in, in certain cases they, they've uh, driven successful cure rates, they come with the painful cost of, of secondary complications in patients. So another big problem is that immune cells that fight cancer are sometimes very rare if present at all. And so this is one of our, our favorite analogies uh, shown here in that regard. I like to think of a cancer specific immune cell as a needle in a haystack. And so our job as scientists and physicians is to vastly increase the number of needles and target them to that haystack, which represents the tumor. And so we can do that um, by engineering a patient's own immune cells with these synthetic receptors called, called CARs, as, as we'll show you. Okay, but before that, let's quickly go over some basics about how the immune system works because we'll be using some, some terms and I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. So the immune system is constantly, constantly as we speak, as I speak, working to protect us from insults. And these insults can come in the form of infectious microorganisms like viruses or bacteria or abnormal cells, which could uh, uh, turn into cancer cells. So how is our immune system really activated? Well, by, it involves um, substances called antigens and these antigens turn on your immune system. And again, the immune system helps your body to fight infectious agents and other diseases. So these antigens are often found on the surface of some things made inside your body, such as cells. And they're also found on the surface of some things from outside of your body, such as the bacteria and, and viral agents that I mentioned. So T cells, where do they come in? Well, they help your immune system to tell which antigens don't belong in your body. T cells are just the type of white blood cell really. And they have these receptors that you can kind of see in this cartoon here that attach to the antigens that I mentioned. And once a T cell attaches to an antigen, it sends a message to other cells um, in your immune system. And then these cells help kill the thing with the antigen and get that out of your body. So at a very basic level, this is, you know, immunology 101, the basics of T cells. So then what's the problem? Well, unfortunately, the immune system that we're born with, it's not often to equipped to win the battle against cancer. But as I said, a patient's own immune or own T cells um, can be engineered to make these artificial receptors that we called CARs or chimeric antigen receptors. And that allows them now to seek out and destroy the tumors, um, as you can see here in this cartoon. So CAR T cells, they're simply um, T cells from the patient's own body that have been genetically modified in the lab so that they attach to those antigens that we talked about on cancer cells. And once a CAR T cells at attaches to the cancer cell, your immune system, again, can send other types of immune cells to kill that cancerous um, cell population and get it out of your body. So that's essentially, you know, at a very basic level, what we're doing and how CAR T cell uh, technology works. Okay, so what is the CAR T cell treatment process like for patients? So you may hear of CAR T cell therapies being described as autologous cell therapy. So autologous simply means from yourself. So with autologous CAR T cell therapy, some of your T cells will be collected or sometimes that's referred to as harvested from your blood. They're sent again to the lab um, to have a new gene added to them. And so this is called genetic modification. And again, this new gene is the code for that CAR, that synthetic receptor that will help your T cells find and kill the cancerous cells. So once the cells have this gene inserted in the laboratory, they're considered CAR T cells. And then once the CAR T cells are ready, 
um, what happens is that the patients get low doses of chemotherapy and that essentially helps uh, get your body ready so that the CAR T cells could work as well as possible. It's not really done to, to kill cancer cells at this point. And, and we'll talk again about each phase of this. So once your body is ready, the CAR T cells are just simply put into your bloodstream. So now let's just uh, look at each phase of the treatment process in more detail, because my goal here today largely is to demystify this um, for many people so that they could really understand it and, you know, make the best decisions. So um, the first phase uh, is called leukapheresis, but it's simply T cell collection. And, and with that, what, what happens is some of the blood is collected from the bloodstream through an IV line or, or a leukapheresis catheter. And the blood will flow through a machine that filters out the T cells and some other white blood cells as well. But then the rest of your blood will be given back to you through another IV line. And this process usually takes only two to four hours. Okay, so um, this, is, this is where we come in, in the laboratory, the people in the laboratory. So after the T cells are collected, they're sent to our labs. And there they have that new CAR gene added to them that allows them, you know, the T cells again to recognize the cancer cells. So this is called the modification portion of this. And again, the T cells that have been modified are called CAR T cells. And while your T cells are being modified, um, you'll, you'll normally uh, complete your, your pretreatment evaluations and maybe some pre-admission testing as well. Um, and this is also a good time to finish uh, planning for your CAR T cell therapy. And it's especially important to make sure that you've made plans for where you'll stay and who your caregiver will be during um, the entire uh, phase of CAR T cell therapy. And so how long does this take? Well, usually we have a uh, patient's T cells in the lab uh, for three to four weeks to complete this modification process. That's three to four weeks after they are collected. Okay, and so then once the CAR T cells arrive at uh, the place where they're going to be infused, again, the patient um, gets chemotherapy um, to help get the body ready for CAR T cell infusion. And sometimes you'll see this if, if you're reading or you're, you know, you're, you're having a, a visit with your oncologist, they call this lymphodepletion or lymphodepleting chemotherapy. And again, all it is is a process of sort of lowering your white blood cell numbers um, to help get your body ready for CAR T cells to sort of make the space that the CAR T cells will fill once they're put into your bloodstream. Um, and this is usually done a few days before the CAR T cell infusion. And um, again, if um, you decide to enroll in one of these trials, uh, along with your, your, your uh, oncologist, your, your clinical nurse coordinator typically gives you your schedule and talks with you about all of these phases and really what to um, expect. And then that schedule really depends on the specific uh, uh, medications and, and treatments that you're undergoing at the time prior to the CAR T cell therapy process. Okay, and so um, if you're having an inpatient CAR T cell infusion, you'll be admitted to the hospital. And this usually happens the day before the infusion takes place. And, and, and it's the CAR T cells are, are usually given uh, to patients in the hospital room. Um, but there are other options as well. And so if you're having an outpatient CAR T cell infusion, your infusion is given at an outpatient center, like a cellular immunotherapy unit. And now a lot of cancer centers um, have these. And your, your nurse or your physician will give you the CAR T cell infusion, again, through your IV line. And it can take as little as five minutes or up to 30 minutes. And again, that really depends on your treatment plan. Um, but of course, staff members are always going to be in the room uh, with you for at least uh, the first 15 minutes of your infusion. We um, stay with you through the entire uh, infusion at our, at our center. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. There's a little bit of a delay here. So what are the responses that we've seen to CAR T cell therapy and CLL? Um, well, Early results of CAR T cell therapy for treating leukemia and lymphoma have been highly promising and very exciting. Um, and most patients whose CLL returned or in who other standard treatments failed 
achieve complete success, meaning no signs of cancer following the CAR T cell therapy, which is always pretty remarkable when I hear it. And notably, as Brian talked about when, when he introduced me, the first two patients who we treated at the University of, of Pennsylvania just had their anniversary and they actually remain in uh, remission more than 10 years later, and they have no detectable um, evidence of CLL by any measure. So I really think that that highlights the power of CAR T cell therapy. And you know, I, I always like to say that, that CAR T cells are unlike any other drug. They're a living replicating drug. They can go anywhere, they could do anything, they can make decisions and they can remember and they can sort of hang around to keep um, cancer at bay if they need to. Okay, um, so we've had some amazing responses. It's also important to talk about some uh, of the potential side effects. So what sort of side effects do we see? Well, the most common is something called cytokine release syndrome, and it's similar to, to having sort of like a flu-like illness. Um, and sometimes neurologic events can also be experienced. Um, and other people just simply sometimes have uh, low white blood cell or, or red blood cell counts. But fortunately, most of these side effects can be managed with drugs or, you know, resolved on their own without any need for treatment. So after the CAR T cell infusion, you'll be monitored closely for side effects. And again, CRS or the cytokine storm, like I have depicted here, um, is uh, you know the major thing that, that we see. So it's flu-like symptoms. Sometimes people get muscle aches, headaches, chills. They'll feel unusually tired. Um, and not everyone gets the same uh, types of side effects. Everybody responds differently um, to this therapy, but there are some common things that we see in multiple patients and, and, and cytokine release syndrome is one of them. But what, again, I wanna emphasize is that that a lot of these side effects are not permanent and that your care team is going to watch and monitor you carefully for any signs of these side effects and they'll manage the side effects. Um, but it's very important for you or your caregiver to tell a member of your healthcare team if you think you're having any of these side effects after the therapy. Okay, so the first four weeks after your CAR T cell infusion are essentially considered the recovery phase. So if you've had that inpatient CAR T cell infusion that we talked about, you'll stay in the hospital for one to two weeks or longer after your infusion. And then, you know, how long you stay in the hospital really depends on how your body reacts to the CAR T cells. But during this time, your, your clinical management team is going to uh, watch uh, carefully and monitor you again for these side effects. Some of them require closer monitoring than others. Um, but once you're ready, you'll be discharged from the hospital. Typically, people stay in an apartment near the hospital um, just so that they could, you know, they're, they're still close to the center. Um, if you've had outpatient CAR T cell infusion, typically um, individuals, they'll have uh, daily appointments for the first couple of weeks after the infusion. Um, and, you know, starting about uh, two weeks after the infusion, you'll, you'll, you'll have appointments less often. Um, but that really depends, again, on how you're feeling. Um, and then uh, long-term recovery is different for everyone, and it depends on your specific situation and how the cancer reacts to your CAR T cell therapy. Um, but again, your clinical team will really tell you what to expect. Um, typically, uh, patients have appointments um, after 30 days, 100 days, and a year after CAR T cell infusion. And uh, you know, during these appointments, you'll have um, tests to check uh, on how you're doing. Um, so that's that's sort of the recovery phase. So you may wonder what's the current status of FDA approved CAR T cell therapy for CLL? Where are we at the moment? Well, right now the FDA has approved CAR T cell therapy for adult patients with certain types of lymphoma and for children and young adults with acute lymphoblastic leukemia or ALL, but they that haven't responded to other forms of treatment. CAR T cell therapy isn't uh, yet a FDA approved for CLL. Um, but we're hoping that that's coming soon. There are, however, uh, approximately 30 clinical studies across the globe that are currently recruiting um, patients. And this is generally for people 
with um, highly relapsed and refractory disease that's not responding to some of the conventional treatments um, that you may have heard about in, in other webinars. Um, but there are uh, about 420, 430 CAR T cell studies actively recruiting patients with a variety of cancers across the globe. And that includes CLL, other sorts of blood cancers, and also solid tumors as well. Okay, so how does CAR T cell therapy compare with other treatments um, for CLL that you may be on or that you may have heard about? That's sort of a difficult question to answer, but I would say that the major advantage is the CAR T cell therapy. What we hope is that it's a single infusion that again requires like we spoke about uh, at the most two weeks of inpatient care and then it's done, right? So, um, that's, that's what we aim for, sort of a one and done, a one-time infusion. And then again, that living replicating drug to just persist, right? Um, and that's clearly different than other therapies. And so also when CAR T cells are effective, they can induce um, deep clinical remission. And there are not many treatments for CLL uh, that I know of at least um, that can induce those deep sustained and complete remissions that you'll see with CAR T cells. So I would say that those are, are, are the major differences. So now that we've gone through um, the basics, I'd really like to talk about the, the most exciting part and that's what's on the horizon. So you know, a, a lot of patients often ask us, what, what, where are you going next? And, and um, after we have this initial, hopefully FDA approval of CAR T cells for CLL, how can we make these CAR T cells better? Um, so we and others are, are um, studying CAR T cells in combination with various anti-cancer drugs. And I'm going to elaborate on one particular drug, Abrutinib, that some of you may be on um, at the moment. Uh, but this approach, this combinatorial approach, appears to enhance the CAR T cell effect in clinical trials of CLL. Other studies are evaluating whether, um, you know, other sorts of interventions like checkpoint inhibitors that you may have heard about that sort of, sort of um, take the brakes off of the immune system, um, whether these sorts of things can increase activation of CAR T cells. Um, also, we and others are trying to develop CAR T cells that can be controlled, um, perhaps by having, uh, you know, signals that are engineered into the cars that allowed them to be killed and eliminated from the body if needed. But I think the more exciting research in this vein is trying to regulate cars. So to turn them on, to turn them off, to turn them up, to perhaps turn them down, you know, at will biologically. And this knowledge should improve uh, really the safety of this approach. Um, and we're also planning on conducting biomarker driven trials of CAR T cell therapy that uh, I'll discuss in more detail in, in just a few moments. Okay, so, um, you know, sometimes the success of CAR T cell therapy that I mentioned um, has limits really. And that's really what I wanted to emphasize here. Um, so CAR T cell therapy, particularly the original strategy that targets the CD19 antigen on the surface of tumor cells, it can work differently depending on what type of leukemia is being treated. Um, so compared to the high complete remission rates in pediatric and young adult uh, acute leukemia that I mentioned earlier during the presentation, CAR T cell therapy drives complete remission in only about 26 to 28 percent of CLL patients. Those couple of patients having that, you know, 10 years of uh, long lasting remission um, highlighted in this category. And so we and others have been really doing research for quite a long time to figure out, um, you know, why this is and, and some of the potential reasons for these disparities in the clinical outcome that we see between acute and chronic leukemia are listed here. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, my mission really in life and in my career is to make CAR T cells work better for CLL patients. And we won't stop until we have something that works for most, if not all individuals with CLL. So really, again, I think this is the future of immuno-oncology. Okay. So, um, again, uh, a major finding from a few years back is that a brute nib that I told you that I would, you know, elaborate on 
which some of you may take to manage your CLL, it works remarkably well in combination with CAR T cells. And we found that this drug actually repairs defective T cells that we often find in CLL patients. And that makes for a more potent uh, therapeutic product when we make these T cells, a patient's own T cells into CAR T cells. Um, and so at the University of Pennsylvania and at other cancer centers, physicians are currently testing this combination in clinical trials uh, enro enrolling that are enrolling at the moment CLL patients. So I think that this is very exciting. Um, and we have strong initial evidence that CLL patients with specific populations of T cells that can sort of be considered as a biomarker are more likely to respond to CAR T cell therapy. And so these um, cells that form this biomarker can be easily identified in a preliminary blood test. And as Brian mentioned at the beginning of the seminar, the ability to select patients most likely to benefit using these biomarkers would have a tremendous clinical impact um, as CAR T cell therapy would really only be applied to patients most likely to experience remission and that would allow other patients who are unlikely to respond, other patients who may not have this biomarker to pursue other treatment options because CAR T cell therapy, of course, may not be um, appropriate for every uh, patient. And so uh, an exciting recent finding is that we discovered that the minimum dose of CAR T cells needed to drive long lasting durable remission is actually a single cell. Um, and this was a case that we published a, a few years back. Um, so the patient whom I'm referring to in this case, he was 78 years old when we first saw him and he had relapsed through multiple conventional treatments. And then he decided to enroll in our trial of uh, CD19 targeted CAR T cells to treat his CLL. And in a series of, of fortunate events, he had uh, a delayed expansion of his CAR T cells after we put them into the, the bloodstream. But when we investigated, we, we traced this remarkable response to a single CAR T cell um, in which our, our, our CAR uh, landed that massively expanded and again, wiped out his leukemia. Um, and he's still in remission and doing remarkably well to, to this day. And it's always a great pleasure to see him and, and, and his family. So this really underscores the power of CAR T cell therapy and, you know, what we could do. And I just wanted to end with uh, my, or I should say our big research uh, goal of the year is to get universal um, CAR T cells into the clinic. So really an off the shelf CAR T cell product and, the reason for doing this is that often too many patients can't receive CAR T cell therapy because of uh, issues with collecting or expanding their own T cells. And also, even if we could make enough uh, T cells to treat a patient, the CAR T cells sometimes don't expand after we infuse them because of those defects that we mentioned, uh, particularly in CLL. We see this a lot in CLL. And so we may be able to solve that problem by, again, making giant batches of healthy universal CAR T cells that you know, can be used to treat not just one patient, but multiple patients. Um, but the big challenge here is that you know, this is a bit like organ transplantation. And so to make universal CAR T cells from a single, maybe healthy don donor that we could give to multiple unmatched or unrelated patients, we need to edit genes in the T cells to prevent them from attacking the recipient's normal tissues and also to prevent the recipient's immune system from rejecting these engineered uh, universal CAR T cells. And so we could do this with uh, um, some advanced uh, genome editing technology. Some of you may have heard of CRISPR technology and that's really just exploded over the past few years. Um, this year, we were able to test the first CRISPR engineered T cells in patients with cancer. And these were patients who had um, multiple myeloma, bone marrow cancer, and also uh, sarcoma. So um, we really think that this approach is going to be a game changer for CAR T cell therapy of CLL. And it's going to allow us to increase patient access to get a lot more folks treated um, with CAR T cells. And 
with that, I guess we could revisit our polling questions and then proceed to the uh, Q&A session, which I think is, is really the best part of the webinar. We'll have you repeat the question you were asked. We won't ask how many people have had CAR-T because um, I don't think that's changed. We should have had a question, how many want to have CAR-T? That would have seen, uh, see if that changed, but uh, we'll just ask about your understanding instead. So just the one question and uh, we'll uh, see what's, um, what the responses are. So I think you get, did a good job there, Professor. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we have 98% of people agree or strongly agree. So um, I, I think that I, I've, I've been lucky to have attended a number of CAR-T presentations. And I think that's, you know, one of the clearest ones, but you didn't, you made it simple, but not simple, too simple. I think you uh, got across and we have a ridiculous number of questions. Um, Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for this. I'm going to start with um, a couple things that are kind of only peripherally related to CLL, but are important. A um, number of people have asked about different solid tumors, and I know that you do research on that. They have family members with solid tumor cancers, one in particular, colorectal. Uh, what, I know there's more challenges there. Can you give us a sense of what's happening there? Yeah, so um, we're advancing CAR T cell therapies for solid tumors as well. They're a bit more challenging than CLL and other blood cancers because, you know, in, in a tumor like colorectal cancer, the CAR T cells have to really traffic, you know, they don't have a lot of access to the tumor like they do um, as if it were in the blood. So they really have to traffic to that site to really multiple sites if it's metastatic disease. And then I always think of a solid tumor ecosystem is sort of a sewer. So even if they can get into that tumor, that is the CAR T cells, they're hit with a number of additional barriers that shut down um, those CAR T cells. So we've really been working for years to tweak them genetically and through, you know, drug enhanced approaches to uh, do battle in that solid tumor ecosystem. And I think we are turning um, the corner and uh, in maybe five years or so, hopefully sooner, um, we'll really have made some headway there. And a related question that is more uh, pertinent to CLL patients, Richter's transformation, one of the huge unmet needs in CLL, we don't have great treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, are you doing research on that? Um, what's going on in Richter's and does CAR-T make sense to you? Um, as a treatment for Richter's transformation now and in the future? Yeah, so um, I think we need to study that more carefully. So when I think you're referring to when the, the CLL transforms into an aggressive sort of B-cell lymphoma. Yeah, usually diffuse large B-cell yeah, lymphoma diffuse is the most large, common. Yeah, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, so yes, I think that um, CAR T-cell therapy can make a really big difference there. But again, we may need to tweak the CAR T cells uh, a little bit more so that they can, um, you know, uh, do battle with that, that sort of tumor. That's a little bit trickier than, than CLL, actually. Um, but I think we're getting there. A practical question from a, from, a, from a patient's perspective who's not reading blood and cell in these journals. How do you stay on top of this? Because it's changing so fast. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, the CLL Society, uh, CLLsociety.org, we have a CAR-T section, we update. This will be there. We constantly having new articles. Uh, Dr. Frieda is writing stuff for us. We just put up an interview with Dr. David Maloney out of Seattle uh, Cancer Care Alliance, another pioneer um, who talks about maybe moving CAR-Ts up in treatment. But Besides our website and some stuff from LLS, do you have other things you advise patients who want to stay on top of the CAR-T literature? Yes, I think so. You know, the resources that you've, that you've made available through the, cell, the CLL Society are just tremendous. Um, and we didn't have that years ago, right? When we, when we started this and this was so experimental and we had only treated um, a handful of patients. So, um, there are tons of resources out there. There are tons of advocacy groups. I think we just have to be careful that the information that we're getting is medically and scientifically accurate. So it's always, you know, consider your sources. Um, but we have wonderful resources here at the CLL Society that could hopefully help 
um, our patients and caregivers vet some of that um, information. But just, you know, keep reading, keep getting smarter, right, Brian, which is one of your main themes. Yeah, smart patients get smart care. Absolutely. Um, uh, so you've hinted, uh, and I've heard hints, that FDA approval may be coming. Can you give us any more meat on those bones, uh, any more uh, sense of, because we know patients are waiting. Right now, the only way you can get CAR T as a CLL patient is through a clinical trial. Right. But do you, do you, do you have a sense? Is that going to be next year? Do you, you know, any idea on, I know that the FDA doesn't call you and say, Joe, what do you, you know, what do you think could, you know, but what, what do you know about this or what is your hunch? Because you're close to these sources. I, I think, I, I think it's going to be happening soon. I know that sounds lame because I don't know when soon really is. Um, I was hoping that it would have happened already. Um, but I think, you know, as we're a, a 26 to 28% complete remission rate, not only at Penn, but at other centers, it's reproducible. Memorial Slim Kettering had a paper out, you know, last year. That's sort of the complete remission rate. But my hope is that as we combine these CAR T cells with some of these targeted agents like a Brutinib, and now we've reported that we really, really increased that um, overall remission and complete remission rate, that that might be the FDA approved product, you know, a combination like that. Um, but I don't have a sense in terms of when it's going to happen. We've certainly demonstrated that it's safe and feasible. Um, so I'm just hopeful. So let me push on that. I have a couple <laughs> questions that go in that direction. The combination with ibrutinib seems to, in CLL at least, improve response rates. And not only you, but um, uh, uh, Dr. Tanya Siddiqui in the mm -hmm. City of Hope and the um, uh, the uh, JCAR, the Lysocell product seems to do a lot better, much higher response rates than that 27% uh, were reported at ASH. Do you, do you see that combination? And the and a second question on that: Does it have to be ibrutinib, or could it be a calibrutinib or zanabrutinib, one of the other BTK inhibitors? Uh, there was a couple questions about that, or do you have, or is it too early to tell? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, I'll and I, and I know you've had John Bird, you know, occasionally mm -hmm. do the the CLL Society panel talks and webinars, and so I start started studying the combination of ibrutinib and. Uh, CAR T cells with John. And um, ibrutinib, unlike some of the other major agents that you mentioned, it's sort of a dirty kinase inhibitor. So it doesn't only hit BTK, but it hits another target called ITK and, and T cells. And it was one of the kind of serendipitously uh, good discoveries in my career because, you know, there's some data out there that if you hit this other target in, in T cells genetically, that it actually suppresses the T cells. So we started looking at this combination because we thought that, okay, abrutinib is becoming the standard of care for our CLL patients. Some of them are going to need CAR T cell therapy, and we're going to collect CAR T, or T cells from these patients who have had abrutinib, and we're going to have to make a very potent CAR T cell product, and maybe the drug is going to interfere with that. And the, the, the serendipity comes in, um, so I started looking at this and I saw the exact opposite. I saw that, gee, patients who have been on a brutinib for six to 12 months, they actually have better T cells, right? When you make them into CAR T cells. And uh, my, um, it was so funny, my postdoc advisors, Carl June at the time, he was like, oh, this can't be right. You, 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 mix, you mix this up, do it again. So we did it again. And then I brought it back to him and he said, no, this can't be right, do it again. Um, then I did it again. And, and uh, so it was, it, it was this, this just crazy, crazy finding. Um, we still don't know why a brutinib exactly makes the T cells better. And, you know, it also hits the CLL cells. So you would expect maybe an additive effect, but it also does something to boost the potency of T cells that we don't quite understand. So I'm not sure how the other, if the other combinations will work uh, as well but we're hopeful. <laughs> right. They haven't been studied and ibrutinib has only really been studied in the last couple of years. Right. And, uh, and I have to say one of the reasons I chose, chose the trial of the Fred Hutch was because it was uh, involved having to be on ibrutinib for months mm -hmm. before and months after. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that now there's other trials going on where ibrutinib is a uh, critical part of that. Um, let me ask you a couple questions about trials. Um, how to... Um, 
uh, there's a lot of CAR-T trials out there. Do you have any advice to a patient if they're interested in CAR-T therapy, how to search for a clinical trial or what's going on? Sure, a great resource, and it's very user-friendly, patient-friendly is clinicaltrials.gov. And you know, you just basically type in CAR and CLL, and you'll see a bunch of things that come up. And then you can refine that search by filtering. So what I tell patients is, you know, check that box to, to filter the, the trials that are actively recruiting um, patients. And you can also filter it, you know, geographically by where the cancer centers conducting the trials are. So again, clinicaltrials.gov is an excellent um, resource. All right. And there's uh, um, questions on uh, for some of our more sophisticated patients on CAR NKs. Um, and I know MD Anderson has done some research and other people on that. Can you explain the differences and uh, wh where you see the future in that? Yeah, so um, that's engineering a different type of immune cell called a natural killer or NK cell with a CAR. So using an NK cell instead of a, a T cell really. Um, and I think uh, the results are so it's 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 more difficult to manufacture um, CAR and K cells, I would say, than than CAR T cells. Certainly, we have much more experience in, in the CAR T cell setting, um, and I've seen some very promising preliminary results. I actually heard last week that some of these CAR um, CAR and K cells are starting to persist in patients, and I think for for diseases like CLL, we really need persistence of engineered, um, you know, cells, the sentinels that I mentioned to sort of hang around. And if the tumor should come back, they should take care. So I think a T cell might do a better job than that compared to like a CAR and K cell. But um, the strategy is very promising. And I think we'll have to see where it goes in the next couple of years, but it's getting better. And I just, there was a question here about ibrutinib and whether you had to be sensitive to ibrutinib. And as uh, Joe explained, it's not the role of ibrutinib in suppressing the CLL is probably important, but of secondary importance. And the primary effect is to take these exhausted T cells and make them active again. So even if you've developed the C481 mutation, you're no longer responding to ibrutinib, the ibrutinib will help with the CAR-T. Here's a question that I got tons of variants on. What are the exclusion criteria? When do you see a patient? Is, is there an age that you won't do? If you're over a certain age, we won't do a CAR-T. If somebody has a heart condition, if somebody's had a former bone marrow transplant, uh, yeah, uh, uh, donor leukocyte infusions, you know, maybe their chimerism is a little mixed up. Um, chimerism is where you, you have some of the donor cells and some of your own cells after a transplant uh, from a, from a a matched unrelated donor or a family member, uh, people with kidney disease, heart disease. Um, what are your exclusion criteria? Because you've got a lot of people seem interested in getting CAR-T therapy and they want to know whether they would qualify or not. Right. So um, it really depends on the trial that was approved by the FDA. And if you go on the clinicaltrials.gov, they really... Um, uh, provide great detail about the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So for our trials, we haven't excluded on the basis of age, but other trials could be different. Um, I think the inclusion criteria for, you know, some of these, well, so for CAR T cell therapy of CLL, it's still an experimental treatment, right? It's not FDA approved. Um, and usually, as I mentioned during the webinar, we're treating um, patients with highly relapsed and refractory disease that have undergone multiple biologic or, or standard chemotherapeutic treatment options. So sometimes an inclusion criterion is that the patients have been on so many lines of you know, a, a particular therapy. But really, again, it varies by, by trial. So just look at clinical trial stock up. You could always contact me or somebody at the CLL Society, and we're, you know, we're happy to help you um, with answering those questions around a, a particular uh, trial. So that uh, 
begs the question of why are car T's seen as this Hail Mary last chance? I mean, those what you left out about the two patients that are alive 10 years later is these patients had completely run out of options. Remember 10 years ago, there was no ibrutinib. There was no right. venetoclax. There was no, they had run out of every option. The CLL was rampant in them, as I recall. These were people who wouldn't be around if they hadn't enrolled in these clinical trials. So it was really a desperation move for these patients to try, you know, a really early trial of something. But now we've got our chops together in CAR-T. We know better about cytokine release. We know neuro events are less common. Things are, even when I had my CAR-T, somebody asked about me. I had CAR-T two and a half years ago, and I have less than one in a million CLL cells uh, by next generation sequencing and feel great. So I'm one, I'm one of the six people on this uh, webinar who've had CAR-T uh, uh, therapy and I'm doing great. Um, so, um, yeah. Why can't we be, why do we have to wait until you failed everything? And sometimes it seems like we're desperate trying to get the CLL under control before we can give them the CAR-T therapy. Yeah, I think um, we're going to be exploring in the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot of trials looking at the use of CAR-T cells as, as sort of a, a first line therapy in some indications. Um, I've talked to some folks at Children's Hospital last week, and I know they're exploring this very carefully in the setting of pediatric and young adult ALL, you know, maybe using CAR T cells um, in the first line over a bone marrow transplant, or maybe to use CAR T cells as a bridge, you know, to, to get to transplant. I realize that it's completely different in CLL, but I, I think that um, you're going to see more and more trials that are not just enrolling the, the heavily relaxed refractory populations of, of patients with a particular cancer into a CAR T cell trial. So um, you may not have to wait in the years to come, right? All right. And what about the prognostic markers in the CLL itself? People are asking, what if I'm unmutated IGVH? What if I have TP53, 17P? Yeah. What if I have large lymph nodes, a heavy tumor burden? What if this is my fourth line treatment? If I've relapsed after venetoclax, relapsed after ibrutinib, d does that make a difference? Or uh, in terms of, is there a particular, is there an ideal patient where you say this person is going to do great, or or a person you say, uh oh, you know, we'll give it a try, but I don't expect it to work. No, looking at the tumor, um, I think that was the most one of the most surprising findings that we had, and so you know, some of the patients whom we've mentioned who have had those. Um, very complex karyotypes, or they've had things like, you know, 17P deletion, where they're P53 deficient, they've actually had complete and ongoing remissions for, for years now. So that wasn't a correlative response. What really was, was the quality of the T cells going into the manufacturing and coming out of the manufacturing, particularly in CLL. So I mentioned some of those biomarker studies. Um, we're not excluding or including patients yet, on the basis of a particular, you know, biomarker or T cell quality attribute. Um, but, uh, you know, we hope to do those biomarker driven trials, like I mentioned in the future to, to apply CAR T cells to, you know, the patients who are most likely to benefit based on those markers. But no, in looking at the tumor, there was no association with mutational status, age, stage of disease, Again, it was a surprising the finding. Deletion 17P, TP53, none right. of that. No. Yeah, and that's, yeah, and that's yeah, interesting. That's somewhat similar to transplants and they're, mm -hmm. they're agnostic to 17P. The cellular therapy seem not to care. But also I think what's different in CAR-T is you can have a heavy tumor load. That too, where, yeah. Yeah, like people have had pounds of cancer. So kind of following on that, if you could explain in a patient friendly way what some of these biomarkers are and why you think, you know, here's a question, do you believe or the research community understand uh, what are the sources of the resistance and why CAR T's only work in, you know, want some percentage of patients only get to a complete response. Can you address what those biomarkers yeah. are and what, what do you think, why you're not getting 100% response rates like we get close to with the kids leukemias? Yeah, sorry, and I sort of breezed through this in the webinar, but the one main difference, remember when we compared CLL to ALL with the same 
um, CD19 directed CAR T cell construct, really that comes down to that disparity in the clinical outcome that is an, uh, close to an 80 to 90% complete remission rate in pediatric and young adult ALL compared to a 26 to 28% complete remission rate in CLL. We think that that comes down to the quality of the T cells. And so, um, you know, in these pediatric patients, they have uh, y- very young, very hardy T cells. They haven't had to fight, you know, a lot of infections. Um, so that means when we engineer them, they can really expand robustly. So you need CAR T cell expansion to wipe out all of that. To, you need um, uh, a lot of CAR T cell expansion to wipe out those bulky lymph nodes and, and things like that and, and packed marrow, right? So um, yeah, so, so the biomarkers, you know, we, we did that. We looked in an unbiased fashion and we looked at thousands of combinations of biomarkers and we used, um, uh, you know, things like artificial intelligence and things like that to, to, to unbiasedly pick out these biomarkers, like something that a human couldn't do, right? And then we subsequently validated them. Um, and they're just different uh, protein tags on T cells that really define a T cell as say like a memory T cell or an exhausted, a war weary or tired T cell. Um, So those are the kind of biomarkers that really we're talking about that are indicative of that T cell quality. So um, we we have a lot more questions. I'll see if I can get through a couple more. There's no way we have well over a hundred questions here. Um, uh, Immune function after, does your immune system reconstitute and what about needing IVIG? I've read papers where people remain B cell, not having B cells, and they're not, not able to form antibodies. And especially in the COVID era, we're a little worried about that. So uh, what, what's the story there, Joe? Yeah, so um, in CLL, most of the patients who we talk about who've had these long-term durable remissions for you know more than a decade, they are um, B cell aplastic, meaning that they don't have um, with our therapy, um, normal B cells that make antibodies, as you talked about, Brian. And so that was kind of the expected consequence of targeting the CD19 protein with our CAR. Um, CD19, it's not exclusively expressed by the leukemia cells. It's exclusively expressed, or it's also expressed by normal B cells. And so, you know, one way that we can get around that immune deficiency that's essentially happening by wiping out the normal B cells with the CD19 directed CARs is through um, immunoglobulin uh, supplementation. And there are um, physicians uh, in our center, and I know other centers and going to meetings and conferences and things like that, who are tracking um, infection rates and looking at the susceptibility of patients who are B cell, maybe aplastic after CAR T cell therapy, um, you know, to things like the seasonal flu and, and, and now other things. But other than that, these patients have been able to, to live very um, normal and, and, and healthy lives. So it's, it's I, I think it worked better than we ever expected. So let me ask you a question on the persistence of, uh, and this is my question, the persistence of the, uh, <laughs> of the uh, CAR T cells. Um, and uh, I understand that there's two factors that kind of go into the success, the, the massive expansion of the T cells. So how big is that killing frenzy when that goes on? Mm-hmm. And then how long they persist in their, um, and I think it, am I right in understanding that it differs? Like the UPenn product might be different than the uh, Bristol Myers Squibb product or the, you know, that which is more important because I have no, CAR T's. I have no measurable CAR T's. That doesn't mean I don't have CAR T's. I just can't find them down to one in a million. But I also have no CLL, you know, left. So, and I had a massive expansion according to Dr. Maloney. So could you give us a sense of, you know, is it, is there a holy grail? Cause I'm getting B cells back again, you know? So is there mm-hmm. a holy grail where you might be able to have your B, have your cake and eat it, have your normal B cells and, and, but, you know, have got, wiped out the cancer, eradicated the cancer in such a massive killing frenzy. Is there, what are your, what are your thoughts on that as a researcher? So um, I think in, in advanced leukemia, I, I think uh, all of the evidence from our group and other groups has pointed to the importance of persi- long-term persistence of these CAR T cells. With that said, 
Um, maybe there is a holy grail out there. Um, I think you wouldn't need persistence if you could wipe out every single, um, you know, CLL, BCLL cell in that first uh, wave of CAR T cell expansion, perhaps, right? Or, or maybe you get, you know, short-term persistence that gives you that, as you mentioned, in your case, a very deep molecular remission, whereby, you know, looking at next generation sequencing, you can't detect um, any BCLL clone. So if you could do that with a single infusion of CAR T cells and they don't persist, you know, I think that that would be the holy grail, right? And then you could reconstitute and get your normal B cells back and you wouldn't need immunoglobulin um, supplementation. So, uh, so maybe it's possible. <laughs> a couple real quick questions with kind of yeses or nos. Yep. Um, CAR T in Canada, do you know anything about that? Yeah, so we've, I, we've looked uh, recently, um, one of the patients from the uh, previous panel contacted me. I didn't see any open trials as of a few weeks ago um, in Canada, but I'm not really sure if that's developed any further. Uh, you can get CAR-T more than once, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why not freeze the cells when they're young and healthy? I'm diagnosed with CLL. Um, why not just, you know, you, you have, we have the ability to do that. Centrifuge them off, send them to you guys, put them in a deep freeze. And when I need it, they're ready and they're not beaten up. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it, it's not a bad idea if it's done correctly um, at, a, at, a, at a center like we have. Um, I think we need a lot of infrastructure around that. You know, we'd be preserving um, apheresis products from so many uh, patients. So we really need, I think some of these like commercial cell banks promising to do that, that um, are not FDA regulated. Uh, I don't think that that's a good thing. Um, so we don't have the infrastructure to really do that, but it is a great suggestion. We probably should be doing that, right? Get them young, get them before um, maybe all of these subsequent rounds of, of chemotherapy. Yeah, I'm going to answer a question and then just finish with one last question here, and that is the um, uh, people ask if you've if you've progressed on ibrutinib, can you still get CAR T? And the answer is yes, because it's not that effect. Um, so the last question is kind of about different markers. Like you know, we know drugs like rituximab target CD20 is very effective. Why is it CD19 and not CD20? What other markers and where are things going? You, you hinted at this CRISPR technology. Um, how advanced is that? Where is that going? Because right now you use a virus, right, to insert the DNA. And, that, you know, that's been very successful. But isn't it possible to leave that viral step out and with CRISPR and just insert what you want with the CRISPR, which is like cut and pasting uh, yeah. the DNA? Um, we hope so. And we're working very hard on, on scaling such approaches um, out and, and to get away from these viral, uh, you know, car gene delivery approaches. And that would also increase accessibility because it takes a, a long time and it costs a lot of money to use, um, you know, these viruses. And they also randomly put that car gene into the gene. So we really can't control where it goes, right? Um, so I think, yes, in that regard, CRISPR is the future. Let's find the, the perfect site to cut and then paste that CAR transgene. And CD19, CD20, ROAR1, other targets that you're looking at? Yeah, we pursued CD19 because it's we can find that on B cells early, early on during B cell development, more of the like stem-like cells and, and the BCLL cells are more like that. So we thought that we could wipe out more, maybe less differentiated BCLL cells by targeting something like CD19 over CD20. Um, but, you know, these other approaches are, are very promising too. And I think maybe even one day we'll have combinations of CAR T cells targeting, you know, CD19, CD20, maybe CD19 and, and, and ROAR1 and every iteration in between. Well, we're going to have to end it there because we could keep going for an hour, another hour or so <laughs> with the questions. Uh, but um, uh, I do want to uh, remember to um, uh, thank our sponsors, Adaptive Bio uh, Technologies, Genentech, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Novartis. 
uh, for their uh, support in making this happen. And um, I do want to thank um, all of you for attending. I mean, that's the whole reason that we do this. We want to make sure that we're all aboard, that we know what the latest technology is. And when I said that uh, Dr. Frieda was on the bleeding edge of this, it really is on the bleeding edge of this. We are so lucky and we're so grateful to you and the work that the people at UPenn are, are doing. And I'll remind you that the Cielo Society through programs like this and all our services is invested in your long life. Please consider investing in the CLL Society by supporting our work at CLLsociety.org. Donate to CLL Society. And we just had a meeting this morning before this is going on. And Joe, I hope your ears are ringing because we have big plans for more CAR T happening next year. Because I think next year is going to be the breakout year. I think I, I'm going to stick my neck out and say I think there's a really good chance that in 2021 we'll have approved CAR T and you won't have to go through a clinical trial to get to it. And we've done some groundwork on uh, myself and some other organizations to make sure that Medicare and Medicaid will pay appropriately for it. Um, so there will be ancillary expenses, but usually the private insurances follow what Medicare and Medicaid do. So I think that there's uh, reasons to be optimistic that this is going to be a viable approach uh, for all of us in the next year. So thank you all for attending. Thank and um, uh, thank you, Dr. Frieda. This was uh, thank fabulous. Thank you. It was thank, great. Thanks, everyone.